Good morning. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to this presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation is by Dr. Michael A. Thomas. Dr. Thomas is REI Division and Fellowship Director at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. The title of his talk is Helping Your Patients Select the Best Method of Contraception. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credits. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about the presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled Questions, and an email address will be provided. The question period will only be open for a three-week period after this presentation is posted. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will be a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Thomas. We're very excited for his talk, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Hello. My name is Mike Thomas. I'm at the University of Cincinnati, and uh, I, my topic today is helping your patients select the best method of contraception. Uh, my disclosures are as follows, uh, and um, I will get into my discussion. Probably the primary thing that you want to know that uh, about contraceptives in general is that as you go through the life cycle, uh, most uh, women and couples will sort of change their methods of contraception, with birth control pills being probably the predominantly used method, and then that slowly and steadily decreases uh, the, uh, as far as the use of birth control pills are concerned, uh, and then uh, uh, sterilization starts to become an increasing uh, uh, part of the armamentarium uh, used as far as contraceptives are concerned as women start to get into their uh, late 30s and 40s. When we look at methods of birth control, we have to discuss natural family planning. Uh, I was sort of chastised once and given a talk to our medical students at the University of Cincinnati uh, because we, I didn't talk about natural family planning as much as I should have. And, and obviously that is a method of birth control, uh, or at least a method that some couples use as birth control. Even withdrawal is considered a method of birth control. If you look, into, if you look at contraceptive technology, uh, the sort of Bible on contraception, uh, birth control, uh, withdrawal is also mentioned as well. Uh, but also there are reversible and non-reversible methods as well as hormonal and non-hormonal methods of uh, contraception. We hope to cover as many of these as possible within the time frame that we have today. Natural family planning, also known as uh, periodic abstinence, also known as uh, uh, fertility awareness methods, uh, uh, generally have a typical failure rate of about 25%. Uh, and there are different types. There's the calendar method where obviously the calendar is used, meaning that you start on uh, day one and then you sort of look uh, during the calendar to see when uh, a person could be the most fertile, uh, which would generally be in a 28-day cycle person uh, sometime between cycle day uh, 10 to 14. And this is in particularly important for someone like myself who spends about 50% of his time helping people get pregnant and the other 50% of the time trying to figure out ways for uh, people not to get pregnant. You know, we use the calendar method in our discussions with our fertility patients all the time, but you can also use those same discussions in patients who are not trying to get pregnant. Ovulation detection methods, uh, like using an ovulation detection kit, uh, can be used in patients who use those methods uh, who are perfect users they have actually a 3% uh, uh, chance of getting pregnant or, or, or failure rate of 3%. Uh, cervical mucus detection, uh, for those patients who do it perfectly, uh, uh, they have a 
perfect uh, rate of failure rate of only 2%. And thermal sim, symptothermal methods, which when they use two or more of the above uh, methods, their perfect use uh, or failure rate is only uh, two to three percent. Now moving to uh, hormonal contraceptive methods, these methods are sort of divided up into two uh, types, which are the combination, which include the birth control pills. Uh, the uh, transdermal patches, vaginal rings, and emergency contraceptive agents. And then there are the uh, progestin-only methods, which are the uh, progestin-only pills, uh, the oral pills, the vaginal ring, uh, the quarterly injections, the intrauterine systems uh, that contain progestins, and the emergency contraceptive methods. Steroid hormones are in all of these pills, and I guess I always like to take some time uh, to just talk about that because I consider this a very important aspect of, uh, of the contraceptive uh, education because you really have to truly understand what you're giving patients. Uh, one of my favorite questions to our medical students and our residents when they tell me the type of pill that they prescribe is, is to, or the name of the pill that they prescribe is to actually go into what's really in that pill. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, probably 70% of the time they don't really know what's in the individual uh, method of, of uh, hormonal method that they prescribe with, be it a pill or a patch or a ring. Uh, but uh, a lot of these uh, hormones that are given are sort of derived from the endogenous hormones. Um, and uh, with these hormones primarily coming from the ovary and some of them coming from peripheral conversion. And, uh, the, the steroid structures are pretty straightforward. Either uh, they are progestins uh, that are 21 carbon compounds, uh, which are derived from natural progesterone, uh, or they are androgens, uh, uh, which are 19 carbon compounds, which most of these uh, progestins in the oral contraceptives are. They are actually derived from uh, an androgen base, and they only have uh, 19 carbons, and then there are the, uh, the estrogens that are used in the combination pill, and the estrogens are primarily uh, 18 carbon compounds. So uh, just knowing the difference between a 21, a 19, and an 18 uh, uh, really reassures me uh, that uh, uh, a resident or medical student or even a fellow has a pretty good indication of what they're prescribing, and a lot of these uh, hormones are on the backbone of this basic steroid structure, which is this uh, uh, primary ring structure. And as you could see, uh, on the 17th position, uh, which is when you get this uh, bulky uh, side chain, uh, that's really where the differences uh, in the, uh, the different uh, progestins in particular uh, take place. With the synthetic estrogens, there are only three that are used. Um, mestronol, uh, which generally has a methyl uh, group, and when that methyl group is cleaved, uh, that methyl uh, group uh, cleavage turns that mestronol, which is also known as methyl ethanyl estradiol, into ethanyl estradiol. And ethanyl estradiol be being the primary estrogen in the majority of the uh, birth control pills uh, that we use and a lot of the other uh, devices that we use, uh, ethanol estradiol is the primary backbone uh, of estrogen, uh, uh, synthetic estrogen that's used. And then there's also an estradiol cypotonate uh, that's used in uh, some of the uh, injectable uh, uh, estrogens. Um, Mestronol, as we said, is cleaved, and once the cleavage takes place, uh, there's a, um, a loss of uh, potency of about 30%. Uh, therefore, a mestronol pill that has 50 micrograms uh, in it is about the same equivalent as a 35 microgram uh, ethanol estradiol pill. And uh, 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 the different types of progestins are subdivided even more. Uh, the uh, progestins are either, as we said, 21 carbons, which are pregnanes, and then the pregnane category include the medroxyprogesterone acetate, the cyproterone acetate, uh, the clomidion acetate, uh, which isn't used much uh, uh, in a number of the, the 
to pills or devices that we use in the United States. And then, of course, the larger category are the 19 neurotestosterone agents, which are subdivided into S-strains and tagonanes. Uh, the S-strains being sort of the first generation, uh, which include uh, norethindrone, norethindrone acetate, ethanol dial diacetate, and then uh, uh, they are the gonanes. Uh, and the native gonanes, which are the second generation, norgestrel and levonorgestrel, are uh, probably a little bit more androgenic. They seem to have more potency or more affinity to the androgen receptor. And then the third generation progestins are the norgestrel, uh, uh, norgestimate, uh, the desogestrel, and the gestadine. The gestadine isn't used in the United States, uh, but the, the norgestimate and the desogestrel, or these third generation, uh, progestins came out in the 90s, and they were derived from the native gonanes, and they have less affinity to the androgen receptor than the uh, uh, norgestrel and levonorgestrel, which appear to have more affinity to the uh, androgen receptor. And then the fourth generation progestin uh, that's available now are the 17 alpha uh, spiron lactone uh, uh, derivatives, uh, which of course means there are only 17 carbons. Uh, and they, uh, the drosperinone, uh, which is the only uh, progestin in this category at this time, uh, has no androgen affinity. Uh, so drosperinone is the only progestin uh, currently on the market that has uh, no uh, uh, affinity or to the androgen receptor uh, whatsoever. Uh, and generally, uh, uh, until the 17 carbon compounds came, became available, we used to also talk about androgen, uh, the sort of properties of the uh, progestin. Those five properties of the progestins included their ability to uh, bind to the progesterone receptor, which made it a progestin, uh, its ability to bind to the androgen receptor. And you see some slight binding even in the pregnanes, but the 17 carbons do not. Uh, they also could bind to the estrogen receptor. And then there's also an anti-estrogenic effect as well as a, uh, a glucocorticoid receptor binding effect. And those were the five primary binding affinities uh, to uh, uh, the steroid uh, receptors. You can see that uh, uh, drosperinone uh, has uh, the same sort of look and structure uh, as uh, uh, spironolactone. And the equivalent dose uh, of the three milligrams of drosperinone, which is in it, the 20 microgram and the 30 microgram pill uh, that's available, uh, is uh, the three milligrams of uh, drosperinone is equivalent to 25 milligrams of spironolactone. The S-strains, the norethindrone, um, uh, norethindrone acetate, and ethanol dial diacetate are associated with a number of the pills uh, that are marketed today, but then there's also the generics, because a number of them are also uh, written in uh, a generic form. Uh, and, uh, uh, and those are available. Uh, and the uh, uh, important uh, piece of this puzzle is that uh, the norethindrone, uh, uh, norethindrone acetate, ethanol dial diacetate, norethindrone, and the uh, uh, listronol, uh, that are the uh, S-strains are all converted to the active form of uh, norethindrone. As far as the gonanes, uh, all the gonanes, uh, whether they are the uh, norgestrel, levonorgestrel, uh, uh, the desogestrel, or norgestimate uh, that are used in the U.S. branded products, uh, which you see here, um, when we look at uh, what they are, a sort of uh, the active form, uh, the levonorgestrel's active form is uh, uh, levonorgestrel. Uh, des des Gestadine, uh, again, not used in the United States, uh, but used in a number of European countries. Uh, uh, you can see that this active form is gestadine. Desogestrel is uh, the three keto desogestrel. And then the norgestimate is uh, actively converted to uh, levonorgestrel. Uh, there are the pregnanes. Uh, uh, still used in contraceptives, so the 21 carbon compounds. Uh, Medroxygestrone acetate is in the uh, Depo-Berbera, uh, and uh, uh, the Cyperidone acetate not used in the United States. 
uh, is in a product called Diane that's used in Canada and Europe. Drosperinone, as I said, is a little different because it has no androgenic uh, affinity whatsoever. Uh, it's an aldosterone antagonist and a potassium sparing diuretic. Uh, Spironolactone is, uh, and it's a, so drosperinone is an analog of that. Uh, the typical daily doses of spironolactone uh, that are used in uh, uh, common practice. We use it anywhere from 50 to, uh, to 100 milligrams in our patients who may have polycystic ovary syndrome that may, and that could because it is a, uh, uh, it can, it's an anti-androgen. Uh, um, it will bind to the androgen receptor without uh, stimulating it. Uh, uh, Therefore, uh, uh, it, it has some uh, definite benefit in use, uh, and you can see uh, it has also been used uh, for patients with edema hirsutism and for patients uh, who uh, have had issues with hypertension. Uh, the drosperinone ethnoestradiol product that's available contains 3 uh, milligrams of drosperinone. As we said, that's equivalent to the 25 milligrams of uh, spironolactone. And as far as androgen binding uh, and progestogenic activity, uh, you can see here that uh, progesterone, uh, paradone, uh, ethnoestrogen, uh, northendrone, and all the other products have a progestin binding activity, therefore uh, it allows them to be called a progestin. And then some of them have uh, little, if any, or no uh, androgen uh, activity uh, or anti-androgen activity. And, and, and some besides um, uh, the drosperinone have uh, some degree of uh, antimineral corticoid activity, uh, which includes the progesterone, native progesterone, uh, drosperinone, and you see some in uh, the gestidine uh, uh, progestin. Androgenic effects of uh, progestin's current birth control pill. Uh, overall, it's, it's thought that uh, if, if you look at uh, the all the birth control pills that are available, uh, patients don't have a defined androgenic effect, meaning that if you give a birth control pill, uh, women are, in general aren't going to have an increase in midline hair growth uh, or acne. Actually, you see a decrease in that because with the combination birth control pills that are available, they tend to increase um, sex hormone binding globulin uh, uh, because of the estrogenic component and because you are decreasing uh, LH uh, uh, stimulation in the pituitary, uh, you get a decrease in androgen uh, uh, production from the theca cells. Um, just desogestrel and norgestimate have less androgenicity uh, uh, than uh, estrains and uh, levonorgestrel. Uh, Drosperinone, of course, as we said, has an anti androgenic effect and it binds to the androgen receptor without stimulation, uh, uh, but it does not prevent androgen binding with sex hormone binding globulin, does not counteract estrogen related sex hormone binding globulin synthesis, and it inhibits production of, of varying androgens because of the decrease in LH stimulation. All combination pills are useful in treating mild to moderate acne. Uh, but there are only three with an indication uh, for acne. Uh, orthotricycline, uh, which has an adjustment and ethnoestradiol, the estrostep product, uh, which has norbendron and uh, ethnoestradiol, then uh, yes, which has drosperinone and ethnoestradiol. And as you can see, compared to cyproterone acetate, uh, which uh, is a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, S-strain, uh, you can see that actually compared to cyproterone acetate, uh, which is a pregnant, um, uh, you can see that uh, both uh, the cyproterone acetate and uh, the drosperinone uh, decrease uh, the mild or moderate acne scores uh, over a uh, six to nine month time frame. Uh, over time, there's this definite uh, decrease in acne scores in using the birth control pill, and th in this case, in using uh, drosperinone and, and drosperinone being comparable uh, to another uh, uh, progestin that has uh, little androgen binding affinity.
progestins on the horizon include uh, uh, nestronome, which is a ni another 19 nortestosterone agent, uh, which is being developed for a vaginal ring with esinestradiol and a transdermal um, uh, gel uh, with with the uh, uh, estradiol uh, as a uh, combination product. Then uh, nomogestrol acetate, uh, which is another 19 nortestosterone agent, uh, but with very little androgen binding affinity, so uh, even less uh, than noted with the third generation uh, uh, products uh, that are currently available. And this is being developed as an oral contraceptive agent with uh, estradiol. So some of the pharmacologic uh, uh, actions in combination pills uh, on the progestin side, you can see that progestins, um, uh, compared to estrogens, progestins have an ovulation inhibition, where estrogens have a follicle inhibition. Uh, uh, progestins have, and the estrogens have both an ovarian uh, inhibition. Uh, the uh, progestins thicken cervical mucus, whereas estrogens thin out cervical mucus, but in the combination pill, the progestin effect is predominant. Uh, so you do get this primary thickening of cervical mucus. Uh, when you look at estrogens, progestin and estrogens, as far as proliferation of endometrium is concerned, progestins actually cause endometrial atrophy, whereas uh, estrogens cause, cause endometrial proliferation. But the predominant effect in the combination pill is a uh, atrophying effect on the endometrium. So if you do an ultrasound, you'll see a decrease and endometrial development, uh, but in the, the last part of this, progestins only would give you a regular bleeding, whereas estrogen give you some degree of cycle control. Uh, so the one of the advantage of having the estrogen in the birth control pill is that you get a fairly predictable uh, bleeding uh, pattern once the pill is withdrawn. Uh, whereas progestin only pills, you get a lot of irregular bleeding because of the endometrial atrophy. So uh, one of the advantages of the estrogen in the birth control pills is this degree of cycle control. Uh, even though the progestin effect is the atrophy, there is a little bit of estrogen there uh, to cause, uh, uh, to decrease some of the irregular bleeding that would occur if you were using a progestin only pill. Some of the side effects are also estrogen and progestin related, and the estrogen related side effects include headaches, nausea, fluid retention, uh, nostalgia, breast pain, uh, hypertension uh, in some cases, and, and uh, uh, leukorrhea, whereas the progestin related side effects include mood changes, uh, depression, uh, decrease in libido, uh, increased appetite, which is uh, fairly rare. Uh, uh, in, uh, the low dose of uh, progestins that are used in the birth control pill. And there is some occasional cyclic nostalgia as well as uh, fatigue uh, noted uh, when using the progestin uh, uh, component. Oral contraceptives in general, there are a lot of users, about 30% of uh, all contraceptive users use a birth control pill, which encompasses about 18 million uh, people. Uh, approximately 80% of all women use oral contraceptives at some point uh, during their reproductive life, uh, but there is a high discontinuation rate. A lot of this is due to side effects uh, 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 that patients will experience, particularly sometimes uh, breakthrough bleeding issues. It's a, it's a high uh, uh, reason that uh, patients discontinue the use of the pill, uh, and among women who continue oral contraceptives, the average duration of use it's about five years before they either move on to something else or uh, decide that they uh, may uh, uh, want to get pregnant. Uh, it's still the most commonly used reversible method of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, contraception in the United States, uh, and it has a high efficacy rate, 99.7% uh, perfect use rate. Uh, and a 92% um, uh, typical uh, use rate, so people use it every day. Uh, uh, the chances of getting pregnant are less than 1%, uh, the, and the chances of, uh, um, of efficacy in typical users is 92% uh, uh, if they use it and they continue to use, especially if you use it 21, 
28 day pack, uh, starting the next pack at the right time uh, is very important uh, because uh, even with a 21-7 pill or a uh, or any t other type of formulation started the next pack on time is important because you start to see that the um, the ovaries the pituitary starts to sort of wake up if you will uh, if you uh, prolong the use of either a placebo or use no method between pill packs uh, safety uh, there are very rare serious complications with the oral contraceptive and uh, actually very few um, uh, absolute contraindications and many non-contraceptive uh, health benefits uh, noted with the uh, uh, use of the uh, uh, birth control pill, the oral contraceptives. The most common side effects include uh, for discontinuation include irregular bleeding, uh, nausea, weight gain, uh, mood changes, headaches, breast tenderness, and these are some of the reasons that uh, of course people discontinue uh, the use of the birth control pill, uh, but there are benefits. There's less salpingitis because of the thickening of the cervical mucus not allowing infected sperm to get inside. There's less anemia uh, because of the fact uh, that there's less uh, bleeding due to the atrophying effect of the lining of the uterus. There's less benign uh, breast disease. Also noted less symptoms of the uh, of PCOS, meaning a decrease in uh, the midline hair growth or acne and uh, um, the birth control pills affects uh, the uh, menstrual cycles, so the cycles are more regular and you decrease the incidence of uh, any type of hyperplasia uh, in these patients. Uh, they all, they're also a decrease in uh, fewer functional cyst issues, less benign ovarian neoplasias, uh, possibly fewer uh, uh, uterine uh, fibers that have been noted, as well as a decrease in rheumatoid uh, arthritis and most of these uh, issues were noted in patients and studies that were done in patients with higher dose uh, birth control pills. Uh, OCs are also protective. Uh, OCs tend to be um, protective uh, against endometrial cancers, ovarian cancers, and colorectal cancers and these risks are decreased uh, for some time even after uh, the birth control pill is uh, discontinued. Uh, there's no increase in breast cancer in OC users or even former users in age uh, uh, 35 to 65. Uh, the risk of cervical cancer uh, increases in long-term OCs, uh, particularly in patients who are infected with the HPV virus. Advantages include uh, efficacy, safety, reduction in maternal deaths and ectopic pregnancies, and decrease in menstrual-related effects, which include uh, dysmenorrhea, menstrual blood loss, and ovulation, and a number of other uh, uh, advantages that are noted. Uh, but OCs uh, sometimes controversially are noted to be associated with some medical conditions, but they're not. And I think there's sometimes a misperception about combination birth control pills. So there's no increase in the risk of melanoma, uh, glucose intolerance or diabetes, uh, gallbladder disease, cholestatic jaundice, or uh, um, yeah, they're not associated with uh, causing uh, any of these issues, uh, or including hepatic neoplasias. Some of the disadvantages of OCs include daily administration, expense, um, lack of sexual uh, transmitted disease protection, uh, Sometimes uh, they can cause a decrease uh, uh, in some patients, a decrease in libido because you are uh, decreasing endogenous testosterone, and there are some thrombosis-related issues. And I'd like to spend some time on that in that uh, one of the concerns sometimes is uh, patients who are um, uh, at potential risk. But when you look overall uh, at uh, risk of uh, venous thrombolic episodes, uh, young women in general uh, are, uh, have a four to five uh, uh, time risk uh, to, be, to begin with the number four to five and incidents of VTs per uh, 100,000 women years uh, and, and uh, uh, pregnant women uh, when you compare them to young women the relevant risk is 12 
in that there are, are uh, 48 to 60 uh, uh, episodes per 100,000 women years. When you play, when placed on an OC uh, that's in uh, uh, greater than 50 micrograms of ethnoestradiol, that relative risk is still lower than that sort of found in the birth control pill. The relative risk is uh, uh, the relative risk of a, of a birth control pill used in a, with a high dose ethnoestradiol pill, which you can't even get these days. The relative risk is six to ten. Uh, and, and OCs in the, with the current formulations, uh, the relative risk is much lower than even seen in a uh, pregnant woman, uh, with the relative risk being uh, three to four. Uh, thrombosis is generally greater in the first year of use. Uh, VTE risk does not change with smoking, varicose veins, or hypertension, and this risk generally disappears within 30 days of stopping OCs. Uh, in looking at different types of progestins in birth control pills that are less than uh, 50 micrograms. Uh, there uh, seems to, leave an ogestral uh, and norgestimate, uh, norgestral, excuse me, uh, seem to have similar relative risk. Does ogestral uh, in studies that have been done of late seems to confer a slight increase, even though we don't think of progestins in general, but uh, having and uh, causing an increase, but whatever reason, the combination of uh, ethnoestradiol and desidrestrol does seem to confer a slight uh, increase in risk uh, with the two of them alone, with the two of them together, I should say. Um, as far as other types of, uh, of uh, devices that are available, the IUDs have been on the market uh, for quite some time. Uh, the the Delcon Shield uh, was introduced in 1970, then withdrawn from the market uh, because there was thought to be a slight uh, increase in infections. Uh, uh, the issues with the Del Concio have been documented very well uh, over the years, and it's, it's thought now that, that, that there may have been some other issues that may have increased uh, the risk of infection uh, other than the Del Concio itself. Uh, and, uh, IUDs were then reintroduced uh, into the market around 1984, uh, with the Paragard being introduced at that time and then released for sale in 1988. And then the Levonorgestrel uh, uh, IUD was started to be marketed uh, in Finland in 1990, then finally approved, uh, the Levonorgestrel uh, dev device approved uh, in uh, the United States in 2000. There was a one-year uh, natural progesterone uh, containing um, uh, IUD that was removed from the market in uh, 2001, uh, and then the copper IUD and the living or current living living just for IUD were the only ones available after that time frame. As far as the copper IUD is concerned, it's a, uh, a great device. Uh, it's uh, good for up to 10 years. Uh, it decreases sperm ability to reach the ostea. Uh, the copper ions um, uh, cause an increase in various enzymes, pr prostaglandins, and white cells to alter sperm movement, uh, and it affects tubal cilia motil motility. Uh, the IUD sort of sits in in its T form to cover a large surface area, uh, so it doesn't basically allow sperm to enter. It's almost like a, a barrier method. Uh, but one of the uh, downsides is that it can, in some women, increase the incidence of dysmenorrhea and uh, menorrhagia uh, in patients. Uh, but the IUDs are sort of the, uh, the hot uh, uh, area right now in contraception um, studies, and uh, you'll probably see different types of IUDs on the market over time. Some of the contraindications of the IUD include uh, copper sensitivities, any current uh, or um, um, uh, recent infections are also associated with the contraindications, known or suspected pregnancy, so these are reasons not to place them, or any severely distorted uterine cavity. As far as the levonorgestrel IUD, uh, the, the current uh, 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 the two IUDs on the market, uh, levonorgestrel on the market today, there are two 
that are being marketed by two different companies that contain 20 micrograms per day of uh, uh, delivery of uh, levin ergestrin. There's a, uh, the smaller one uh, that's 12 micrograms. Uh, there may be one in the future that contains 16 micrograms. Uh, currently, uh, uh, the levin ergestrin IUDs are, uh, you can use one for three years, up to three years, the other currently up to five years. Uh, the three-year uh, uh, current IUD uh, is probably going to get an indication at some point to up to seven years, which is what uh, leaving adjuster IUDs uh, uh, um, are used. That's how long they're used in uh, European countries, up to seven years. So the goal is to get a leaving adjuster IUD that can be used to up to seven years. Uh, they do have a number of uh, contraceptive and non-contraceptive benefits. Um, uh, it thickens cervical mucus, which is probably the primary mode of action. Uh, the uh, sperm is decreased uh, in its motility and function. Um, uh, if, if it does enter the uterus, uh, the endometrium is suppressed. Uh, you get this weak form body reaction. And uh, even though not a lot of the progestin uh, gets into the bloodstream, in some uh, women, it's been noted that there have been some inhibition of uh, ovulation, particularly in the first couple of years of use. Uh, when you look at the levonorgestrel IUD overall, compared to, say, the copper IUD, there is a slight uh, decrease uh, in uh, five-year gross cumulative failure rates, uh, and uh, compared to all sterilization, uh, levonorgestrel. IUD is very favorable and uh, even compared to postpartum uh, salpingectomy, uh, the progesterone IUD is very favorable. Return to fertility is, is very good. Uh, when you look at the two IUDs side by side, they are the same, meaning that once you remove it, the chances of getting pregnant seem to be the chances of anyone else getting pregnant within one year, which is about 80%. Uh, contraindications to the leaving the gesture IUD, of course, include some of the same as with the copper IUD, uh, which would be pregnancy or suspicion of pregnancy before the IUD is placed, any acute cervical or endometrial infections, uh, or any uterine anomalies. Uh, some of the side effects of the leaving the gesture IUD because of the potential for uh, some of the hormone to get into the bloodstream, uh, mood changes, acne, headaches, breast tenderness, uh, nausea, and I guess uh, amenorrhea uh, is another uh, uh, side effect of this uh, device, uh, but no weight gain is reported and it doesn't seem to have an effect uh, uh, on uh, weight, if, uh, depending on the patient's weight, that does not uh, seem to affect the uh, uh, IUD uh, as far as its efficacy is concerned. Uh, some of the non-contraceptive benefits of the Libronogestrel uh, devices are available include a uh, effect uh, to decrease menorrhagia, increasing hemoglobin uh, iron and iron stores, uh, decreasing uh, dysmenorrhea. It's a great therapeutic option for patients with endometriosis. Uh, for uh, uh, those patients who uh, need um, endometrial protection if they're using uh, any type of hormone replacement therapy, uh, any estrogen therapy, having the IUD uh, with uh, a progestin uh, allows that patient to take an estrogen without uh, any uh, adverse effect on the endometrial lining. Uh, and uh, because some of the oral progestins can cause some mood changes, having a local progestin with very little of that hormone getting into the bloodstream uh, appears to reduce uh, some of the discontinuation rates associated with the uh, oral progestins in, uh, post in perimenopause and postmenopausal women. Also, the luminogestrel IUD appears to mitigate some of the tamoxifen-induced endometrial effects that patients have when um, uh, post-breast uh, cancer therapy using tamoxifen uh, would put them potentially at higher risk for endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial polyp formation. Uh, it's been noted that um, uh, the levonorgestrel IUD in place uh, negates the hyperplasia and negates any of the polyp formation. Uh, so it, is, uh, it does have some benefit 
uh, for patients who use uh, tamoxifen. Uh, other reversible options include the uh, vaginal uh, ring, contraceptive patches, of course diaphragms, condoms, cervical caps, subdermal rods. There are different types of condoms that are available, uh, latex condoms, uh, which include uh, natural uh, latex and natural rubber. It's, uh, uh, they have water-based lubricants. It does give some uh, protection against uh, STDs and HIV, uh, but there are allergy concerns associated with the latex condom. Uh, there are the natural membrane condoms, which are the uh, lamb cecum condoms, which have small pores. Uh, therefore, it doesn't give as much protection against uh, STDs uh, uh, in general. Uh, then there are the polyurethane uh, condoms, uh, uh, which do prevent uh, against STDs, and there don't appear to be any allergy concerns. And this is an example of a female condom. Uh, and there are two types, they're the polyurethane and the nitrile, which are both uh, non-latex, uh, and uh, uh, they appear, they are more expensive than the male condoms, uh, but they uh, appear to have the same sort of safety profile uh, as the male condoms. Uh, and the typical user failure rates are about 15%. Perfect users uh, are about 2%. And uh, uh, the most common difference between the typical and perfect use of condoms includes uh, just being very consistent using it with each act of intercourse. Um, the uh, ways to, to decrease failure rates is to use every time uh, to prevent uh, breakage or slippage, uh, meaning when the, obviously when the condom uh, slips off, making sure that's placed appropriately uh, on the penis, making sure that it's not withdrawn until it's completely out of the vagina, and uh, making sure that uh, 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 lubricants, water-based lubricants, are only used with the condom so that you don't erode the rubber. Uh, as far as uh, other types of uh, methods of uh, contraception, uh, female sterilization, where you actually cut or block the uh, fallopian tubes, uh, uh, is still a very common, uh, considered a non-reversible method. Uh, failure rate uh, in the first year is about 5.5 per 1,000. Uh, over 10 years, is about uh, 18.5 per 1,000. Uh, some of the failures are due to either pregnancy and being pregnant at the time of the procedure, um, um, having a fistula formation, uh, a surgical error, meaning that the um, uh, uh, the round ligament was cauterized instead of the fallopian tube. So, uh, in, in cases, uh, the fallopian tube has to be followed all the way out to the fibrillated end, and then just uh, uh, cauterize or remove that part of that uh, 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 organ, not any other uh, uh, organs uh, that are in the uh, pelvic cavity or you can even have an equipment or device failure. Uh, costs are, uh, can be probably as high as, as, as uh, $1,200 to $2,500 or higher in some instances. Uh, as far as the risk of ectopic pregnancies, 32% of pregnancies uh, that uh, occur after uh, a female sterilization is generally associated uh, with a, an ectopic pregnancy, so one-third of pregnancies after a uh, sterilization failure, uh, female sterilization failure is probably an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, lowest incidence with unipolar cauterization or postpartum self-injectomy. Some of the causes include fistula formation after electrocoagulation, uh, inadequate coagulation, or inadequate occlusion after a Pomeroy clip or ring procedures. There's also transcervical methods of occlusion, which include uh, the eSure, so a hysteroscopic approach where you put the coils uh, inside the tube. We use them a lot these days for non-contraceptive reasons as well for patients who have a hydrosalpinx. Uh, eSures are uh, being used, uh, but in those cases for contraception, there's a 96% occlusion rate at three months and 100% uh, occlusion uh, that are noted after about six months. There obviously is some controversy and some regret with the e uh these days. Um, 
and uh, uh, those issues are still being sorted out, but it's still on the market. From an experimental standpoint, um, uh, there is a there are a group of individuals who want to use quinacrine. Quinacrine is a anti-malarial drug. Uh, when used in a slurry uh, in the uterus, it's thought to uh, cause a caustic effect to sclerose uh, the ostea. Uh, a number of individuals, including uh, Jack Lippies, who developed the Lippies Loop, and Elton Kessel, who are um, uh, uh, been around in the uh, fertility field for a number of years who are big advocates of quinacrine. Uh, we'll see what happens with quinacrine as a transcervical occlusion method in the future. Uh, and this is an example of how uh, the uh, uh, Esure actually goes into uh, the ostea. And in those cases where it's being used uh, these days uh, for fertility purposes, the Esure is being placed even further uh, in the uterus. But of course, that's uh, experimental and uh, it's not uh, currently indicated for that reason. As far as male contraception is concerned, uh, again, there's not a lot out there for uh, male contraception. Um, and uh, right now, uh, uh, the, the goal of a male contraceptive uh, is to cause uh, either azospermia or severe oligospermia. Uh, azospermia is sort of inconsistent uh, with a lot of the uh, hormonal devices uh, that are available, uh, but severe oligospermia is sort of where you want to get to uh, in uh, a lot of the cases of uh, particularly the hormonal contraceptive market. Uh, severe oligospermia being uh, generally less than uh, 3 million or less than 1 million, depending on what you read. And the failure rate when you get to severe oligospermia is less than 1%, uh, which is similar to hormonal agents used consistently uh, by female patients. Uh, vasectomy being um, uh, the uh, current way of uh, at least getting to azospermia uh, in a non-hormonal fashion where you have to just block the vas deferens, uh, the failure rates are usually pretty low. Uh, for the most part, uh, uh, less than 1% uh, if uh, done properly. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, depending on the literature, you can get uh, some literature that reads as high as 3 to 5%. And, uh, uh, a lot of the studies with the higher failure rates are due to the fact that uh, they demonstrate sperm in the ejaculate uh, um, uh, at some point. And a lot of the times the failure rates are due to not allowing the 70 to 90 days after vasectomy to take place before the vasectomy is used as its as the primary method of uh, contraception. Some of the post-surgical complaints that men can have relative to a, uh, a vasectomy is uh, scrotal swelling, bruising, uh, pain, bleeding from the incision site, or this tenderness or dragging sensation that they can have. And again, some of the failures due to not waiting the three to four months for sole use, recanalization of the vasect of the vas, occlusion of the wrong structure, uh, congenital duplication of the vas, and the costs are generally low. Uh, the cost of a vasectomy is generally a lot less than the cost of uh, female sterilization, and the cost can vary, uh, as I found here, from three hundred fifty to seven hundred fifty-five dollars. But in sure, in some uh, areas it could be a lot more expensive than that. Uh, some of the post-surgical complications of a vasectomy include chronic testicular pain. So 33% uh, of men who have a vas, or a third of the men, will have some occasional testicular dis discomfort, but 2% can have pain that can actually negatively impact their life. Uh, some treatment includes sitz baths uh, for this discomfort, NSAIDs, antibiotics, even sperm cord blocks, but major uh, uh, issues can cause uh, men to actually reverse the vasectomy or to even get a denerver denervation of the spermatic cord. There are other uh, hormonal, uh, there are other non-hormonal methods which include uh, 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 surgical heat, and these are considered in the experimental category, so external heat, uh, uh, nifedipine, has been used for 
uh, uh, male contraception. There are enzyme inhibitors, immunocontraceptives, uh, retinoic acid receptor antagonists, uh, papaya seed extracts, linoleic uh, acid, and also neem leaf extracts have been used as non-hormonal methods of uh, male contraception in an experimental uh, sort of way. Also, there are vast uh, occlusion methods, which include uh, reversible inhibition of sperm under guidance or reversible injectable uh, uh, silicone plugs. Some of these are used, have been used in India uh, uh, and, and, and uh, Asian, uh, other Asian countries. And these types of methods of when you can actually open uh, 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 the scrotum, get into the vas and place uh, and insert a uh, uh, intravas uh, 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 device uh, and then sew over it. And then these devices can be used and removed uh, later. Some of the other experimental methods that have been used for male contraception include different types of pills, uh, injections, implants, and gels. These include testosterone-only agents, uh, as well as uh, agents that contain testosterone with a progestin or testosterone uh, with a uh, GnRH antagonist. Uh, on the horizon, uh, uh, being studied very carefully are the combination uh, agents, including uh, the nesterone, which we talked about earlier, uh, with a testosterone gel. Uh, the nesterone has, uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of androgenic, estrogenic, or corticoid activity. 89% uh, of the patients who took this nesterone testosterone gel combination uh, had sperm concentrations that were less than 1 million per milliliter. Uh, there's the DMAU, uh, which is a 19 norandrogen with activity at the androgen and progesterone uh, receptor uh, that's been used in experimental, on an experimental basis. Uh, there's MIT, the 7-alpha methyl 19 or testosterone agent, which is more potent than testosterone uh, it's resistant to 5-alpha reductase, therefore it lacks uh, any type of progestogenic activity. It's formulated primarily as an implant. Uh, it uh, also supports bone health and it reduces intraprostatic uh, androgen activity, uh, uh, and, and it, but it doesn't seem to be inconsistent uh, when given, uh, the release is inconsistent when given with a progestin. Uh, one of the issues that you sometimes have with some of these androgens is that they may cause some degree of benign prosthetic hypertrophy. It doesn't appear to really cause a lot of testosterone cancer, but uh, BPH is noted as mint. Uh, actually, uh, you don't see that because it, there is not a lot of intraprosthetic uh, androgen activity. The uh, biggest problem with uh, male contraception is that there's not a lot of research being done. Uh, the only research being done now is through the male contraceptive development uh, program, uh, uh, which is sort of akin to uh, the female contraceptive clinical trials network, which I and uh, my other uh, 18 uh, other centers, uh, uh, 19 centers altogether, that are involved in. There are 10 male research centers. Uh, and they do a number of different things, both basic translation and, and clinical trials. And this is really where a lot of these uh, male contraceptive uh, uh, development and future male contraceptive de development devices are being done. So overall, when we look at what we are looking for in an ideal contraceptive agent, we want it to be safe. We want it to be effective. Uh, we want it to be reversible or non-reversible. We want it to be acceptable uh, by both partners. Uh, we want it to be available, affordable, and ideally dual protective. Uh, so when the development and when we try to formulate a reason uh, and to try to pick a perfect contraceptive agent uh, uh, for our patients, it depends on how much of these boxes, how many of these boxes we can actually check to try to pick the ideal contraceptive agents for our patients. And with that said, the World Health Organization and the CDC come up with the medical eligibility criteria 
for patients who have issues uh, and, and in trying to pick uh, the different type of uh, contraceptive for a patient with any type of uh, current or former disease state. Uh, and these medical eligibility criteria are uh, uh, looked at uh, on a fairly routine basis. They're supposed to be uh, looked at every three to four years and, and through a consensus process uh, by an expert working group, uh, the criteria uh, may or may not be changed. Uh, you can find out information on the medical eligibility criteria through uh, either the World Health Organization website or uh, in the United States, the CDC.gov website. And they rate uh, um, a medical condition and then whether or not a contraceptive that should be used uh, uh, based on four distinct categories. Uh, category one is uh, that a contraceptive can be used. Uh, number one uh, category is if the condition for which there is no restriction. Uh, uh, or number two, a condition where the advantages outweigh the theoretical or proven uh, risk uh, or uh, a, contra a specific contraceptive agent can be used in a condition where the theoretical proven risk outweigh the advantages or method use or um, uh, uh, in uh, the case of uh, a, a time when a contraceptive method should not be used for a particular medical condition. And that's number four, a condition where there is an unacceptable health risk if the method is used. So if you have a patient, for example, say, who has a history of DVT, uh, what uh, MEC category uh, would be used for combination oral contraceptive for a patient with a history of DVT or pulmonary embolism? And uh, the answer is category four. So that uh, would confer an unacceptable uh, risk. So a patient with a current DVT or pulmonary embolism, uh, if you try to decide whether or not a combination OC should be used, and of course, uh, that would also be category four. And uh, patients who, in whom a uh, uh, oral contraceptive use is being considered patients who've had minor surgery without immobilization. That's, of course, no risk. The risk, uh, there is uh, no uh, thought risk associated with that. In patients with a history of a thrombotic mutation, as far as oral contraceptive use is concerned, uh, that is, uh, those patients are placed in category four, so they should not be used. In a 23-year-old with factor V Lydon who is homozygous and wants to use a 20 microgram low-dose ethnoestradiol containing OCs, uh, which category, uh, which medical eligibility category would they uh, uh, particularly fall under? And that would be category four for patients with homozygous risk. And, or a 50-year-old smoker using smoking 13 cigarettes a day whose sister has a history of DVT after a skiing accident is on an OC for 15 years uh, and she wants to continue her OC despite uh, smoking 13 cigarettes a day and she falls into category three. With that, I hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, and learned from uh, my talk on OCs. I hope it has helped you uh, to uh, sort of look at and determine which OCs would be best used by uh, your particular patient and help you to formulate a plan, specific plan for a, a patient uh, who is requesting oral contraceptives. And I now open it up to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.